So I'm talking about different ideas about love. What is love? What is love? <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, Louisville. All right, so we're talking about, well, I'll leave that running, actually. Hell no. So, Emma Goldman. Emma Goldman's talking about love, right? And she's talking about how marriage and love are the complete opposites. So, let's see here. The popular, about, the popular notion, see, all this has been so good, okay. The popular notion about marriage and love and love is that they are synonymous, that they spring from the same motives, and that they uh, cover the same human needs. Like most popular notions, this also rests not on actual facts, but on superstition. Marriage and love have nothing in common. They are as far apart as the poles, North Pole, South Pole, love, marriage. They are separate. In fact, they are not just separate, but they are antagonistic to each other. No doubt some marriages have been the result of love. Not, however, because love could assert itself only in marriage, but much rather it is because few people can outgrow a convention. There are today large numbers of men and women to whom marriage is not but a farce, but who submit to it for the sake of public opinion. At any rate, while it is true that some marriage are based on love, some marriages are based on love, and while it is equally true that in some cases love continues in married life and maintain that it does so regardless of marriage and not because of it. The love is there, not because of the marriage, but because the love is there. It, not because of the marriage. So the love and the marriage part are separate if it's a healthy relationship. On the other hand, it is utterly false that love results from marriage. On rare occasions, one uh, does hear of a miraculous case of a married couple falling in love after marriage. But on close examination, it will be found that it is a mere adjustment of the inevitable. Certainly, the growing used to each other is far away from the spontaneity, the intensity, and the beauty of love, without which the in intimacy of marriage must prove degrading to both the woman and the man. My mother actually used to talk about how man and woman should have a contract that they were renew, renew every year, because that's how love is supposed to work. It's supposed to be ongoing, a development process. And it should be renewed. Well, it, I think it's a good idea to renew it, to renew the vows, to say that you, you do love each other, and to say it loudly, and to tell everybody that you still love each other. Love is the mystical dream. Love is the reason to get married. And if marriage does not have love in it, you shouldn't be married. There's no reason to be in a loveless marriage. That hurts everybody. So, growing used to each other, if you're just growing used to each other and you're not being spontaneous and intense and you don't see the beauty of love in your life get out get out now get out while you still have some life left be free so marriage is primarily an economic arrangement it's an insurance pact and it differs from the ordinary life insurance agreement only in that it is more binding and more exacting. Its returns are insignificantly small compared with the investments. In taking out an insurance policy, one pays for it in dollars and cents, always at the liberty to discontinue payments. If, however, woman's premium is her husband, she pays for it with her name, her privacy, her self-respect, her very life, until death doth part. Moreover, the marriage insurance condemns her to lifelong dependency, to parasitism, to complete uselessness, individual as well as social. Man too plays his toll. Man too also pays a toll. But as his sphere is wider, marriage does not limit him as much as women. He feels his change more in the economic sense. Thus Danto's motto over Inferno applies with equal force to marriage. Ye who enter here leave all hope behind. <laughs> um, so they're saying that for the women, let's see, if our women's premium is her husband, she pays for it with her name, her privacy, her self-respect, her very life, until death doth part. Now, until death doth part is both. Both are given their lives. 
But she's kind of saying that women are given more in a marriage because they're given their entire soul and their life and everything about them. Their privacy, you know, they're, they're taking the man's name. I am you, I'm there for you. Whereas the man, he pays the toll, but he views it as the economic sense. He feels like he's paying for the, all the stuff, or that if, if there was, um, you know, since he's paying for it all, if there were, was a separation, he would lose half of his shit. So he wouldn't want to lose half of his shit. And that's why he would stick with her. So he feels his change, but it's in the economic sense, in money, in terms of dollars and cents. Whereas the woman feels it uh, completely in the whole, uh, all her spirit, her life. So this is a, she uses Dante's motto over Inferno. She says it applies with equal force to marriage. Ye who enter here, leave all hope behind. That marriage is a failure none but the very stupid will deny. None but the very stupid will deny. One has but to glance over the statistics of divorce to realize how bitter a failure marriage really is. Nor will the stereotyped Philistine argument that the laxity of divorce law and the growing looseness of women account for the women that first every twelfth marriage ends in divorce. So this is back in 1900s. Every 12th marriage, one out of 12, now it's 50%. One out of two marriages end in divorce. Second, that since 1870, divorces have increased from 28 to 73 for every 100,000 population. So it's tripled, nearly tripled. Third, the adultery since 1867 has grounds divorce has increased 270.8%. Fourth, that desertion increased 270%. Adding to these starty, startling figures is a vast amount of material, dramatic and literary, further elucidating, elucidating this subject. Robert Herrick and Together, Panera and Mid Channel, Eugene Walter and Paid in Full, and scores of other writers are discussing the barrenness, the monotony, the sordidness, the inadequacy of marriage as a factor for harmony and understanding. The monotony, the sordidness, the barrenness, the inadequacy of marriage as a factor for harmony and understanding. The thoughtful social student will not content himself with the popular superficial excuse for this phenomenon. He will have to dig deeper into the very life of the sexist to know why marriage proves so disastrous. Edward Carpenter says that behind every marriage stands the lifelong environment of the two sexes, an environment so different from each other that man and woman must remain strangers, separated by the insurmount insurmountable wall of superstition, custom, and habit. Marriage has not the potentiality of developing knowledge of and respect for each other without which every union is doomed to fail. Henrik Ibsen, the hater of all social shams, is probably the first to realize this great truth. Nora leaves her husband not as a stupid critic would have because she is tired of her responsibilities or feels the needs of women's rights, but because she has come to know that for eight years she's lived with a stranger and borne him children. Can there be anything more humiliating, more degrading than a lifelong proximity between two strangers? No need for the woman to know anything of the man, save his income. As to the knowledge of the woman, what is there to know except that she has a pleasing appearance? We have not yet outgrown the theological myth that women have no soul, that she is a mere appendix to man made out of his rib just for the convenience of the gentleman who is so strong that he was afraid of his own shadow. <laughs> Well, there's more, there's more to deep passion love than just a pleasing experience. It's you don't love who's the most beautiful. You love the people who can make your world the most beautiful. So there's, again, it's the love of yourself, love of the other, and love of the world. They always battling it out. That's the trinity. That's the holy trinity. Love for yourself, love for another, and love for everybody else. So... Could there be anything more humiliating, more degrading than lifelong proximity between two strangers? <laughs> no need for the women to know anything of the man save his income. As to the knowledge of the woman, what is there to know except that she has a pleasing appearance? Have we not outgrown the theological myth that women have no soul, that she is a mere appendix to man made out of his rib just for the convenience of the gentleman who was so strong that he was afraid of his own shadow? Perchance the poor quality of the material whence women Woman comes is responsible for her inferiority. At any rate, woman has no soul. What is there to know about her? Besides, the less soul a woman has, the greater her asset as a wife. 
the more readily she absorbs herself and her husband. Is this slavish acquiescence to man's superiority that has kept the marriage institution seemingly intact for so long a period? Now that woman is coming into her own, now that she is actually growing aware of herself as being outside of the master's grace, the sacred institution of marriage is gradually being undermined, and no amount of sentimental lamentation can stay it. From intimacy almost, the average girl is told that marriage is her ultimate goal. Therefore, her training and education must be directed towards the end, that end. Like the mute beast fattened for slaughter, she's prepared for that. Yet strange to say she is allowed to know much less about her function as a wife and mother than the ordinary artisan of his trade. It is indecent and filthy for a respectable girl to know anything of the marital relation. Oh, for the inconsistency of respectability that needs the marriage vow to turn something which is filthy into the most purest and most sacred arrangement that none dare question or criticize. Yet that is exactly the attitude of the average upholder of marriage. The prospective wife and mother is kept in complete ignorance of her only asset in the competitive field, sex. Thus she enters into lifelong relations with the man only to find herself shocked, repelled, outraged, beyond measure by the most natural and healthy instinct, sex. It is safe to say that a large percentage of the unhappiness, misery, distress, and physical suffering of matrimony is due to the criminal ignorance in sex matters that is being extolled as a great virtue. Nor is it an exaggeration when I say that more than one home has been broken up because of this deplorable fact. If, however, woman is free and big enough to learn the mastery of sex without the sanction of church or the state, she will stand condemned as utterly unfit to become the wife of a good man, his goodness consisting of an empty brain and plenty of money. Can there be anything more outrageous than the idea that a healthy, grown woman full of life and passion must deny nature's demand, must subdue her most intense craving, undermine her health and break her spirit, must stunt her vision, abstain from the death and glory of sex experience until a good man comes along to take her unto himself as a wife? That is precisely what marriage means. How can such an arrangement end except in failure? This is one, though not the least important factor of marriage, which differentiates it from love. Ours is a practical age, the time when Romeo and Juliet risk, risk the wrath of their fathers for love, when Gretchen exposed herself to the gossip of her neighbors for love. That is no more. If on rare occasions young people allow themselves the luxury of romance, they are taken in care by the elders, drilled and pounded until they become sensible. The moral lesson instilled in the girl is not whether the man has aroused her love, but rather how much. The important and only God of practical American life, can the man make a living? Can he support a wife? That's the only thing that justifies marriage. Gradually, this saturates every thought of the girl. Her dreams are not of moonlight and kisses, of laughter and tears. She dreams of shopping tours and bargain counters. This soul poverty and sword, sordidness are the elements inherited of the marriage institution. The state and church approve of no other ideal simply because it is the one that necessitates the state and church control of men and women. Dallas, there are people who continue to consider love above dollars and cents. Particularly, this is true of that class whom economic necessity has forced to become self-supporting. This tremendous change in women's position wrought by the mighty factor is indeed phenomenal when we reflect that it is but a short time since she has entered the industrial arena. Six million women wage workers, six million women who have equal right with men to be exploited, to be robbed, to go on strike, aye, to starve even. Anything more, my lord? Yet six million wage workers in every walk of life, from the highest brain work to the mines and railroad tracks, yes, even detectives and policemen. Surely, the emancipation is complete. Yet, with all that but a very small number, the vast army of women wage workers look upon work as a permanent issue in the same light as does a man. No matter how decrepit the latter, he has been taught to be independent, self-supporting. Oh, I know that no one is really independent in our economic treadmill. Still, the poorest specimen of a man hates to be a parasite, to be known as such at any rate. So, Emma Goldman, thoughts on love and marriage, to be continued, more coming up. Occupy Louisville, we are changed, the Revolution Cup.
Let's get free. Working families party. Louisville. Revolution. Peace.